Alrighty, it's 6.30. I'm now going to call the meeting of Charter and Rules to order. Uh, my name is Nelson Rafael Roman. I'm the Ward 2 City Councilor and Chair of this committee. To my right is the Ward 5 City Councilwoman, Linda Vakin. I believe you're the Vice Chair of this committee, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Mm -hmm. Perhaps. So, yeah, you are. so in case I'm never around, you know who's next. And then um, City Council President Todd McGee will be joining us shortly. He texted that he's on his way. So I'll entertain a motion to take up item number one because we have some of our guests here with us. So this moved. Evening. And so I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So um, item number one was proposed by Councilor Todd McGee. It was filed by Councilor McGee on May 20th of 2012. So we're taking this up. This has been discussed a few times in this committee. Um, ordered that the newly formed charter group look into the pros and cons of combining the personnel department within the school department, hg and &E, and other personnel offices within the city of Holyoke into one centralized human resource division. Um, so that's been referred to this committee. It was taken up all the way back in May of 2012 and recently tabled uh, in November. I wasn't on the committee then, so I could reach out as the new chair and invite you all here. So if you all would like to actually come in the circle, you're more than welcome and invited, and you could take a seat at any of the wonderful desks with mics. Or grab the mic. <laughs> or grab the mic and you can move cords. it forward, yeah. <laughs> hey, oh, right on top, look at that. You're like, boom, and we're joined now by City Council President and Ward 6 City Councilor Todd McGee. Who was or seven. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Tired. One. Yes, let me not. So, um, what I figured is now that you're here, Councilor McGee, I'll actually let you tee this up if you'd like. I've had some amazing conversations with our personnel director here for the City of Holyoke, um, who couldn't be here this evening, but I met with her and her team, Naomi, um, and I met with the mayor and got some feedback as well, so I'll share that with the committee as well. But uh, if you just want to tee this off or discuss why you filed the order or yeah, sure. turn it over, and you can take over. Thank you. Uh, this order was filed some time ago uh, with regards to trying to save money for the city of Hoyoke and kind of avoid overlap. Uh, if you look at corporations, they have one HR department. They don't have five different ones throughout the company. So why can't a city do that? Uh, I'm not trying to tell people that we're laying people off or combining departments to lay people off. I'm just trying to say that when people leave, is there a way to have others work together because it's personnel and HR matters. Uh, some have little nuances, whether it be school versus city, but if you look at what's currently going on, the information that we received was uh, the personnel person that we have now for the city covers X number of employees by herself with probably one assistant, and she's now leaving April, you said? 13th, yeah. April 13th, so now we'll have just a temporary person? No, she's, she's permanent. And then it'll be permanent. So we're down to one person. So the problem is uh, the posting, from what I've heard, was only for $40,000. Who are you really going to get for $40,000 to run a city's uh, HR department? So we have to, in essence, think outside the box to try and come up with a way that all departments can work together to address this matter because if we don't, What's just going to keep happening is we're going to get people coming in, out, in, out, and then ultimately what happens is you, you run into serious problems. So we're starting to see that in other, other areas of the city. So for me, I've been trying to get ahead of this. Uh, it's taken now, this was May 20th, 2012. Um, and it's not because of the current chair or any other chair. It's just been ongoing uh, discussion. So now for me, it's we have to come up with some ways to... To make it work I know it's not going to be easy I know it's you know some departments have their own thing they want to intertwine if it's a school uh, and a teacher has an issue well then maybe we have to come up with creative ways to they have their own meetings on the side it, it can work we just have to work out the details so for me I'm going to keep harping on this because I do believe it's a serious cost-saving measure to the city of Hoyoke and it's something that we have to start doing not only with this type of department, but throughout the entire budget. So that's why it started. Once again, it's not to pick on anybody. It's really a true cost-saving measure, if we can get it to work. Thank you so much. And with that, um, what I'll do is I'll allow you all to basically highlight your departments. I figure it's a good way for us to learn. Um, you know, I've only been on the council for two years now, going into my second term. So, <coughs> excuse me, I apologize for coughing. Um, on the mic, how rude of me. Um, but it's really good for me to learn, and just for example, I'll give you all an example. Um, I sat with Kim Counter, who is the current 
acting HR administrator for the city of Holyoke. Um, as we know, we had, um, when I first came in, we had a different personal administrator, uh, Mr. Judd, who was there. He then retired basically almost a week or two after I started. So I'm not sure if I jinxed him or if he wanted out when I was here, but it was really good for me to sit down and learn from our city department up until last month, Kim was by herself, and she handled 550 full-time regular or regular employees, 100 to th up to 300 temp employees in the summer when Park and Rec goes up and other things, and then 950 retirees. So one person was taking care of all of that number of individuals, and she transferred over our health insurance packages for all of those individuals. We just did a switch on the city side where our benefits packages as far as healthcare switched to Blue Cross Blue Shield. She had to re-enroll or change over all of those individuals and she acts as frontline staff. So they don't have a receptionist or a clerk. So she handles um, all those individuals. So it was really good and helpful for me to learn. So I'll just open it up to you all to highlight your department. How many employees do you have? What do you take care of? How many employees are in your HR departments or staff? And um, what are your thoughts on this matter? So, I mean, ladies first, if that's okay, if I could be chivalrous and allow the school department to go first and just kind of highlight your department and share with us. And you make sure the mic's on. Push the button, okay. Just so your name and your title too. My name is Beth Gage. I'm the chief talent officer for the school department. Um, I've been there for about a year and a half um, and the department has evolved since I've been there. Um, the structure currently in the department is there's myself and then we have three HR generalists um, who support very specific schools in, in almost all HR functions. Uh, we have a recruitment manager and one part-time support staff, which is temporary. Um, we deal with really high turnover um, in the district for the past two years. We've filled approximately 175 teaching vacancies every year um, and and worked with probably about 65 to 85 waivers at a time in helping those educators to become certified um, so you know there's a, a pretty heavy lift um, especially in these first few years of turnaround uh, we've had to really invest a lot of time in developing pipelines um, in and partnerships with community members colleges um, we you know um, have worked to improve our systems a lot too um, that's been a heavy lift for us that's something that I really think the city should evaluate is where can we integrate our systems to be one um, I know we've talked about this on the finance end of things, but Munis would be really beneficial to share. Um, and I think that would help with the consolidation of perhaps some of the benefit work um, and perhaps even payroll, um, which doesn't currently fall under our HR division of the school department that's currently under finance and operations. I don't have the number off the top of my head. Um, it's a much larger department though, um, just because they have accounts payable, accounts receivable. They have a few financial analysts over there. Um, I would guess, would you guess 10? Uh, yeah, and then and then Matt, and then he has some employees at Central Supply, so um, it's just much larger. Yeah, the scope is larger too. And so you said 175 teaching vacancies. Overall, how many mm. staff members does the school department, your department, oversee in total, like all staff? So we're at about 500 teachers, about 200 paraprofessionals, probably about another 200 other. Yeah. Twelve hundred total, yeah. Yeah, that that's very true. Um, subs and temporary workers. And now, do you handle any school retirees as well? Or is that the city? We do not. The city handles that. So once they leave the school department, then the retirees go to our HR. Correct. Um, for MTRS, though, I believe that's the state because it's a state system okay. that they're the ones managing that. And I think they go into GIC at that point. I don't know what that means, but it sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> it's just another insurance. Right. Okay, plan. perfect, perfect. Yeah, state um, and yes. may I ask your name and your title? Of the... All right. My name is Pat Merza, and I'm a human resource generalist. I've been with the school department for 22 years, 
and most of it was doing the insurance and recently I've been um, promoted to the human resource department. So doing personnel issues, insurance, support for any of the employees. Yeah. Thank you and congratulations on your recent promotion. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to allow, um, if you could just remind me of your name again. Terry, Terry Sweetie to talk about HG&E. And then I also want to recognize that we were joined by our colleague and former chairman. It always makes me feel good and warm inside to see the former chairman here. Councilor Joe McGivern is here. So if you could just take over again. All right. Thank, thank you for inviting uh, the Ashton Electric to this meeting. Is that what? It's, it's, it's a bit on. Yeah, do, do I really need it? me just for a sec. Can you make sure the light is on on your microphone? I'm hearing it's off because this gets broadcast on television. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. We're you. live. I would have dressed up. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you look fine. You look yeah, fine. yeah. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Great. And how many, so 150 and then 160 peaks in the summer? They're about, yeah. Same question for you. So you handle all your retirees as well. So after... No. So once no, they... our retirees, uh, we, we handle our own insurance. Uh, you said Blue Cross Blue Shield. The city switched over to Cigna last year uh, from Health New England and Blue Cross Blue Shield. So uh, we put people on uh, the health insurance. We take people off. And when somebody retires, we then coordinate that with the retirement board and Kim Counter. Uh, so they, they take it uh, after that. Thank you so much. Um, and I will just share for my colleague's sake the notes that um, I spoke with Kim Counter. She shared a report. Um, and as did Jim Lavelle. Jim Lavelle shared with us the report um, that I forwarded to the committee members, Review of Financial Management Structure, Division of Local Services Technical Assistance Section from March of 2015. So I forwarded that to the committee members. And then Kim um, also forwarded us a report um, that was dated from the Collins Center. They did a very thorough, in-depth study of merging this very same issue. Human Resources and Compliant Audit and a Policy Review for the City of Holyoke in 2014. Um, and the recommendation I got from Kim is, first of all, we're, I'm sad that we're losing another individual um, you know, that's had so many years of service. So thank you all who have been serving. And for those who are new, thank you for joining the city. We love you. Contrary to belief, the council loves uh -huh. the fact that you guys are here. We don't want to, we want to dispel that rumor here. We're very happy that you all choose to work for the City of Holyoke, so thank you. Um, but her biggest concern in outreach was the fact that the HR department here is understaffed. So on her way out, she was very, very honest about that, needing a frontline staffer to handle whenever a retiree just drops in or an employee with a payroll issue, 
they are also serving as frontline staff. And so for months there, she was by herself, almost years, she was by herself as a staff of one. She actually acquired Naomi from the school department, is now over here. She's doing great, we're happy she's over here. But once Kim leaves April 13, Naomi will be by herself until we fill that HR administrator position. So Kim's recommendation based off of this study, if you look at municipalities surrounding Spring uh, Holyoke, Westfield has, well, they have a higher number of employees served. They're serving about 3,375. They have a six and a half staff members there. They have a one point you know, ratio of staff to people, one and a half. Um, Northampton that has about 1,900 has four staffers. They have a one to four ratio. Chicopee with 3,000 employees, they have four, a one to seven ratio. And West Springfield, which has about 1,200 employees, they have three staffers at a one to four ratio. So her recommendation was, if we can fully staff our HR department, that would be the step one. And then talk about, even if not merging, but having you all in the same office space or environment where there's a HR school department in this wing, hg and &E in that wing, it would be beneficial for that cross communication. So you could still be separate in the work that you do. Uh, if someone comes in for a very specific school question, but just knowing that there's a centralized place where you all can still operate independently, there's not a merger per se, but she would just like to see it fully staffed. And then she expressed her concern with our um, residency requirement for the human resources director in the city and said that she felt that we would be able to maybe attract more talent if for that specific position, we were able to waive it or remove that residency requirement. Um, that was number one. And then number two was of course the salary study and pay for all of these positions because you know we're, we know Mr. Judd made more than that. The starting salary range is only I think 40 to 45,000 that was listed when they put it out. So they're not sure how many talented folks they're gonna attract. So. Was there a reason for that? Well, he, I, think, he was, I think the maximum is 60,000. He was being 60, paid more than that. 60,500. Yeah. He was being paid, paid more than that. something, yeah. I recall. Yeah. Why are we going so low? I'm not sure. You know, that's what she was told to put out, so. You don't have to go that low. Um, but those were her concerns that she brought up immediately, is, is saying that she hopes that if they can have a frontline staff, high, you know, keep Naomi as the second assistant, hire a full-time personnel director, get the department fully staffed and functional, then we could talk about that. And I did speak with the mayor, and the mayor said that he has been speaking because of their strong relationships with the law department, maybe a shared clerk in the law department, so they can have a frontline person. I know I brought that up to the president already. Um, the mayor stated that, you know, in his opinion, he's every year put in his budget request to fill a third position, and that we, the council, have cut it. So we talked about that. Um, but I'm just sharing you all the notes and feedback that I got from everyone. And so then the mayor said that he, again, this year is going to put in for the HR personnel, the assistant, and the clerk, in hopes that that department then becomes fully funded. And I did get an email from Jim Lavelle that said the same thing, that in order for hg &E to feel comfortable, and I'm sure even the school department, the city's HR department would need to be fully staffed so then you all can come together and have those discussions. So that's the feedback I got. I'll open it up to my committee members for any questions, comments. Councilor Bacon. Thank you. Um, from my perspective and with the challenges I've seen in our human resource department, I think what is needed is strong leadership from whichever current HR department has the strength to provide it to the city. We've had turnover in that department and the functions in the city side um, related to City Hall are woefully behind the times. I mean, when Bob Judge came in, they didn't even have the personnel files separated into the proper compartments, which everybody else had done 10, 15 years ago. So I really think while we do need the people, certainly, the adequate numbers of people to do the work, what we really need is a lead person that has the knowledge base to assist the people to get the department into the current state of events that it should be in. Um, and I think that's a knowledge leadership function rather than number of hours and people issue. Um, and I can't say that from the perspective I sit at, which is not to be able to get into it in great depth, that there's been a whole lot of progress made in that regard um, from reports coming to us. And I think some of it is to our chairman's point that people have been short so they've been overwhelmed. But on the other hand, I just think in the keeping up of day to day, there really hasn't been the 
pulling together of the cleanup and getting it set up properly so that it gets continued properly. So I don't know um, if you all feel like that would be too long of a stretch for either or or any department to extend that role over to the city side. Um, but I'd be interested to understand if there was any available resource in that regard. I mean, I'll speak to that. I mean, right now with, with the, the place we're in right now, it would be really challenging, to be honest. I mean, we're, we're trying to settle all of our union, con like we're trying to work mm -hmm. with the unions to consult with them and get agreements in place with mm -hmm. all of them. We handle internally our own like discrimination claims, EEOC claims, all of those, those um, time consuming um, complaints that we receive. We handle the discipline. There's a lot of change happening, as you guys know, at the school department. So to add that on and develop a plan for that transition would be, be really difficult in my opinion. Um, and I think it would take away from other key priorities in our department at least. Yeah, I mean, the yeah. concept that I'm thinking about um, didn't really anticipate a receivership situation. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, you know, right. um, context is important. Yeah. But I think um, where we've had the general understanding that some departments are strong and have very clean and tight processes where the city hasn't, if that could be brought to bear, it would be a good thing. But, but that's why we ask these questions. Um, I, I don't know. I can't speak about the school. I can't. I used to work a lot with Bob Judd. He would involve me in a lot of things, and since he left, that just doesn't seem to happen anymore. But the challenges we have at the G&E uh, on the recruiting side, most of the people, we, we don't have any entry-level positions anymore. We used to have this job called a part-time meter reader, and thousands of people would apply to it. But technology has taken over our meter department now, and uh, your meter is now read electronically by antennas in the city. So uh, gone are the days of entry-level positions. Most of our union employees are skilled tradesmen. They're licensed electricians, licensed plumbers, linemen, um, and it's just difficult to find those people because um, you know, if you're a lineman, you're a lineman, and you can be a lineman in Holyoke, or you can be a lineman in Chicago. It's uh, it's all the same thing. On the management side, we're probably half of our non-union employees are degreed engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, civil engineers, environmental engineers, um, and we work a lot with. We have a cadet program in the rest of the world. They would call it an internship, but we have a, a cadet program where we tend to grow our own engineers and have had a lot, of, a lot of success. I mean, the challenges for human resources just keep getting greater and greater every year uh, with, with regulations from the state and federal government and policies and procedures that the state has that you know, we have to implement. Um, it, it just is what it is, and you've got to be ready for it. So do you feel that there would be um, in that you referred to the collaboration that you had going on in the past, sure. which has fallen off for whatever reasons now. In that model, did you see that you were providing a leadership role in terms of the current state of regs and assisting in that regard um, to the yeah, city I'm, side? I'm the generalist. I'm it. The buck stops here. Certainly everything I do runs through Jim Lavelle. Um, but yeah, we have responsibility for, for all that kind of stuff. So I guess the question would be, given all the current levels of responsibility and intensity, would that be something that could be, come a more formalized relationship for the overall city? I don't know. I mean, I, I know what I do. Uh, you know, 45, 50 hours a week, it is just intense with mm -hmm. the things we have to do. When we need to hire people, that's what I that's do. It. You yeah. know, I mean, it is doing whatever we can to get out and accommodate. I work out of Suffolk Street, I don't know if you know, but the g &E actually has seven different locations. So we have our 160 employees spread over seven places. I work uh, what they call the main office on Suffolk Street, and in the main office, um, 
there are these people, we call them superintendents, but they're really like division vice presidents, division general managers. So I've worked very closely with the, uh, with the superintendents, as, as they're called, on a variety of issues, from employee complaints to safety to promotions, transfers, training programs, all that kind of stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor McGee? I, I guess my question is, um, what are the differences that you see your department does compared to the city side and that's why you have concerns. Someone said there was concerns out there. Could, could I hear what those concerns are? Yes, yeah, so I don't completely know what, what the responsibilities are for like Kim Counter specifically and what areas, like I'll give you an example the other day, like when we had a discrimination <coughs> claim, uh, we called Kim to find out um, how she handles it and apparently like that's legal. So I don't know where like their divisions are Exactly. One of my biggest concerns is is systems and, and just not having the overlap with them, um, not having them integrated together. Um, so they're working very siloed right now, um, and projects like that take a lot of time to merge um, and take a lot of planning. And you know, looking at the timeline with this, like April fourteenth is coming very soon, um, and I don't think that's something that could be accomplished in that short period I'll of time. I'll clear that one yeah. up. It, it's, it, this is not designed to say it's happening by April 14th. Okay. Right? This is, like I said, this has started in 2012. 2012. So it's, it, it took finally time to bring everyone in, and honestly, I do thank you for coming in to, to start this discussion. My thing is, we have always fought here with regards to the system, Eunice being the key one to point to. Certain departments use it. Certain departments may or may not use it. Certain departments will call Eunice on their own, have them come in and get charged for it while not other departments knowing about it. So it is sporadic. It, to me, I think it's chaotic. Mm -hmm. We have a Munis system that we pay for. Um, we should have one person who's in charge of Munich to make sure everyone's getting the same training and the system is integrated for it. We're all paying for it. Right. To view it as being separate for each silo, it, it to me is a little strange. So I'm going to keep fighting that battle in, until we win it. My thing is, one of the thoughts that came out, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chair, fully staff our personnel department to then combine. Mm -hmm. And what's the point of having this meeting? If we're going to fully staff our department, we're adding to the budget. I don't need to combine the departments. That is the most illogical plan I've ever heard. I'm going to fully staff it to then combine it to get my savings. It's math. If you want to cut cost, you say, okay, we're not going to hire new people. We combine the departments to say that if you're out that day, you're stepping in to help cover or a temporary staff can cover it. If there's a personal matter that's stuck with just the school department, you can segregate that into a separate office, deal with that, but then you come back into a centralized office. You don't fully staff everyone to then combine it. Where's the savings there? I mean, come on. I mean, that's, it's, it's like we're not even going to address the issue. Me, integration, I'm not saying it has to happen overnight. It's a computer system. Bring in Munis, combine them all together to do payroll, to do retirement. To, that's what Munis is for. It's a computer program. You guys can do it. We can't use Munis. Oh, fine. Then whatever you need to then have it integrate in some way, we can do it. Well, we have ADP. I don't think it integrates. Once again, you can call it ADP, you can call it Munis, you can call it whatever you want. You get one centralized computer software system to deal with the problem. To say that your system is superior than their system, whatever, that I'm not going to take as an argument. No, I can tell you Munis can't handle our payroll. That's why we have it. Once own. again, you can get a software system or can design it. I mean, what's the year now? We can't get a software system to integrate with everyone else? Well, we really yeah. can't? I think, I think there's been conversations about making that happen, but currently we're on two different versions of Munis, so we can't integrate until that upgrade is made. 
Um, I think just in addition to the systems, though, another concern that I would have is the amount of knowledge that would be for one leader. With all the laws and regulations in the state to have the expertise to manage all of those groups, I feel like it is a lot. Um, if I may, to offer to the committee and to you all, I would like to forward you all because, you know, like I said, I've, and I'm thankful for the president and the Council for filing this in 2012. In 2014, <laughs> um, two years after he filed this, and I'll forward, and I forward it to my committee members this evening, I'll forward it to you all. There was extensive study done by, like I said, the Edward J. Collins Center for Public Management that looked into exactly what you were saying, and they gave detailed explanation on what we needed to change by ordinance, mm -hmm. what policies needed to change within all HR departments in order to merge, as well as what no one needed to touch or change because within each specialty area is what they called it so like within the school department we just passed here in this body the fact that you don't have to check off if you've been convicted of a felony or crime for the city as an employer unless it has to do with finance or youth and so in your case the school department application might look a little bit different but it spells it out specifically in detail from the 2014 report and Jim Lavelle gave another very detailed report from 2015 that was done on the financial systems level of looking into those things where the city could save money. And I agree with my colleague. For me, it's to say, listen, and this is all I think that the council's trying to say, we're hurting in our HR department here as a city of Holyoke. And so if we're seeing that overall, I'm just looking at the number of employees overall to have a fully staffed and functional HR team, we need three for the city, we can go with one or two from hg &E and you know you have six currently you said or seven about including myself it will be six six yeah. it's just it's uh, according to the 2014 report it should have been seven mm -hmm. so to have a fully fast staffed and functioning hr team should be about maybe 10 or 11 people in exactly what councilor mcgee saying if overall we have eight or nine this engine is chugging a little bit slower could we, instead of putting out for a personnel director at 40000 pay an HR director overall for the city, give an extra additional twenty thirty to say, hey, can you help us be the leader? Look over all these departments and help us get our ship back in order to Councilor McGee's statement, but to fill those positions again is crazy. But I respect it's, it's new and, and what? Somebody was taking note of what you said, and I said he did say ship. Ship, yes, ship, ship. <laughs> I have gum in my mouth, I apologize. <laughs> gum in my mouth, Sorry. I said ship. No, thank you, Councilor Bacon. I do not want that on the news tonight. Um, so I, that's all we're, and, and, and I thank you, like I said, I thank you all for coming, because we want to start this conversation to say we're not, oh, the rain's coming, we have to do this by April 14th, but to Councilor McGee's point, we're also facing constantly every year a budget deficit. How do we put these things in line? And if all the retirees are coming here to the city, think about that disservice. Whether they're from your department or your department, we're now down to one employee that's supposed to service those retirees. And think about that knowledge. You're calling Kim when Kim's gone. Right. Who we're going to call? Ghostbusters? So. Yeah. But that's, I think that's all the point we're trying to make and start this conversation. And I hear your concerns. And exactly with the MUNIS or the ADP, that's a huge concern. How do we reconcile that? How do we work that out? And the other thing I wanted to ask you about specifically, because I heard, besides the MUNIS and payroll, from a technology standpoint, is there anything else like from a system standpoint, like our HR hiring portal, or is there anything that you see that like you know you use in the school department, but we're maybe still on paper or pen or right. Um, so I'm not aware of all of the systems that you guys are using mm -hmm. um, on the city side. We currently have we manage several different systems in human resources alone. Um, we currently use Talent Ed, and we have two different modules. Which is, one is Recruit and Hire to manage our applications, and then the second piece of that is Records, which is to do our onboarding um, and new hire paperwork. Um, and we'll be building on that. Um, so basically, we're moving so that we have electronic personnel files instead of paper files. Um, we also have Global Compliance Network, which manages our annualized trainings that employees are required to take. Um, we have TeachPoint to manage our teacher evaluations and professional development. Um, we have School Brains, where uh, really the only management piece we have in that is to enter the 
teacher information, personnel information. Um, obviously, it's used by other departments after that. And am I forgetting any, Pat? That's like, that's a lot. Yeah, well, and Munis, of course, yeah. And, and so, Terry, yep. After Terry, what are what are some of the systems you all use at HGE? As you said, like it's more of a skilled trade labor. So, on your recruitment side, do you use any online recruiting, onboarding, hiring systems at all, or no? Well, our recruiting is online is through our website, where you can complete an application online. It all comes to me. Um, we have a system called Navaline. It's uh, Sun is part of it. Navaline is our um, uh, our ERP system, it's our customer service, it's our payables, receivables, uh, purchasing. Um, so all of our folks integrate through that. Um, uh, payroll is through uh, ADP. And those are currently the only three systems you use. So the online HGE website for? Well, the online is part of our, uh, I'm not sure I would call it a system, it's part of our website that we post our jobs on there and you can apply online. It's really just part of our uh, our internet home system. Thank you so much. Yeah. Councilor Bacon. I just had a quick question. Who has the updated version of Munis? The school department. Okay. Because um, in, the, in my experience on the council, there has been a very high level of resistance to using the Munis system on the city side. The system appears to function adequately but if people refuse to use it, it <laughs> doesn't work. Right, right. It's the old garbage in, garbage out theory. Yeah. Um, which is why, again, I go back to the situation that we're in is needing leadership so that people that are the line people or the um, daily HR folks have a leader that knows what needs to happen right. and, and keeps that level of accountability mm -hmm. steady throughout the system and we start using the systems instead of paper. We have a MUNIS system that could automate many functions in the city and people are using paper and I, my theory is, and not to be cynical, is that paper can be shredded and data can't. So um, I'm a big fan of accountability and the use of data but we need leadership and you know, with this position and then that position and not getting the arms around it, we continue to flounder. So, uh, but your feedback has been very helpful and um, certainly every department and every circumstance is gonna need special expertise. Um, but those needs dictate what just to add to, like it might be worth like looking at current contracts that we have individually as a school department to see if there's like some cost savings there that could be implemented as well. Um, for example, one of the areas that we've reviewed on the school department side is our employee assistance program. Um, I believe you guys are still using River Valley. Uh, we found a significant cost savings by going with another group. Um, so like that and even talking about you know if you guys are interested in moving to online paperless applications and personnel files combining contracts so that you we get more of a discounted price from the vendors that may be a good place to start yeah you know go with the low-hanging fruit where it's right. common rather yeah. than different yeah, and, and there might be a little bit more of an upfront cost with that. Like, just like that's what our part time temporary person is doing. She's kind of managing that transition into the paperless um, process mm -hmm. and our recruitment manager. So, some additional resources need to go into that upfront, but in the long term, it will be a more efficient process for us and save on space. <laughs> sure. Yeah. What, what is the Munis system that you have? What's the current? I want to say it's 10.4. Um, I can I can get that for yeah, you. Yeah, can email that yep. when, you, when you have a chance. And you said the city's behind on that. The last I heard, they they didn't they were behind. Um, I'm not sure what version it, they is, were on. Is 10.4 the highest that they have? No, or no, no. It what? is not. I don't know the highest oh, okay. that they have. Okay. Um, I I believe. It might be like 11.4 or somewhere okay. around there, so. Perfect, thank you yeah. very much. You're welcome. Anything else? No?
Um, I just want to, again, I should have said this in the beginning, be clear and transparent. And for the record, actually, my partner, my mother, works for the school department, so I'm very familiar with your HR systems, but it's because I have two people that work for the department at home, so I just want to be transparent <coughs> for folks at home, just for all intents and purposes, to be fully transparent. Um, and I guess I think the final question is, you know, we're probably going to table this conversation today uh, at the recommendation of the maker's request. Just, and again, thank you guys for beginning this conversation, um, but is this something that maybe, you know, we can find like a task force, because Naomi's gonna be by herself. Exactly what you're saying, the low hanging fruit, she's not here this evening. Right. I know I wanna share that information back with her, but you know, maybe we can form a task force so when this comes back up, maybe the three departments can say, hey, these are areas we saw where we can save, or help or align before we're talking about merger, here's some of the ways we've saved some money. So if yeah. you're agreeable to that, you know, we can start an email chain and yeah. look at that, the council's making stuff happen, see? <laughs> um, is there anything else from the committee members? Any of the counselors have any questions? No? All right, and I'll entertain a motion. Motion, motion to the table. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none. Motion's been tabled. Thank, Thank you, you both again. so much Thank for being much. here. Thank you so much. All right, motion to take up item number two. Second. Sorry, to entertain a motion, sorry. So moved. <laughs> is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion number two is followed by Council Roman, ordered that the City Council Charter and Rules Committee explore committees of the City of Holyoke in comparison to other municipalities with size of similar councils to see if there's any opportunity for streamlining or expansion of the current Council of Committees. This was tabled, I'm not sure why, so I just figured we'd clean it up and... Uh, yeah, I think know. there were two orders that were filed that were very similar in wording, but one was taken up and moved when we redid our committees. And so oh, I think I would offer I, a motion. I know what happened. So when we filed orders, some were already in the jacket on establishing new committees, right. and then some came in at the next meeting. Right. But the former chair had set up a meeting Due to open mean laws, you couldn't take the ones that were put on the agenda yes. to then put in right. and take them up. So mm -hmm. what they did is they came in afterwards. This became part of the discussion in the first meeting. When we got to the second meeting, it was kind of like a duplicate, but we said, since you weren't here, table it. That's why we right. table it in order to have you in to kind right. of... So I'm going to offer a motion that it's complied with. Is there a second? Fine with that. I'm totally fine All right. with that. All right. Motion is that so we comply with it. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Alrighty. Motion to take up item number three. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, three, oh. Perfect. Item number three is just our approval of our meeting minutes. Ryan emailed those out to yep. all of you. Make a motion. Uh, accept the minutes of. Motion's been made to accept the minutes. I'll second that. Motion's been seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion's approved. Uh, motion to take up and open the public hearing for item number four. I'll entertain a motion. Motion is open a public hearing for item number four. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, item number four, proposed by Councilor Roman, ordered that the City of Holyoke uh, place a non-binding ballot question on the next election ballot. Ballot question should be, should uh, 16 and 17 year olds vote in municipal elections? Shall the City of Holyoke implement and allow residents of the age of 16 and 17 the right to vote in municipal elections? Um, since I'm the maker of the order, I guess I'll tee it off and then we can have some conversation and some discussion. And there's been plenty of feedback on Hello Holyoke and in my emails. And uh, it's been really, really a good conversation. And again, um, and even hearing back from Rep Vegas when he was in front of our DGNR committee, understanding the ballot timeline for this year. And, um, you know, maybe a lot of these that I thought I would want on for this election, we can put on for next election if we go down that path as a committee. So I filed this order simply because we all know that in every election we discuss, we go to these youth debates and forums, the Holyoke High School Heralds, all these younger individuals. In the last election, we had an 18 year old who challenged me, which was great, we still talk, we're good friends, um, and other young individuals who are getting more and more active in electoral politics. Um, as you know, we do have an issue with voter turnout, voter engagement. My philosophy and thought process was, A, I wanted to look if any other municipalities in the US allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote, in local elections, one, is it legal according to the Constitution? And two, um, is there any place that does this? And is this a way where we can encourage and really excite our young electorate in Holyoke to get involved? So the first question was yes, other municipalities in the US have done this. 
Two, we wouldn't be violating any laws. There's currently another municipality in Massachusetts in Eastern Mass that's considering the same question. Um, and three, I love our Holyoke youth. I think they do a great job. Um, so I placed this on there just to consider it and see. Um, I do have two calls out, um, so that's why I want to continue this public hearing. Our next hearing, we're going to get high tech and fancy now on this committee. I got my projector screen and we're going to Skype with the municipality in Eastern Mass on why they're considering it. And Parkland, Maryland was a city in 2013 that approved and allowed 16 and 17 year olds the right to vote, or Tacoma Park, sorry. Tacoma Park, Maryland, and their voter turnout, it only increased by another 3%, but 16 and 17 year olds did turn out to vote. Um, and so I think if our young electorate is young enough to get a permit or they're young enough to go off to war, or be drafted, then they should have the right to vote. And I think that it's just us building capacity. So that's just my personal opinion. I did want to hear from the public. I've heard from some people to say, hey, kids shouldn't vote because they're eating Tide Pods nowadays. And other people say, hey, kids are brilliant. So I thank the city of Holyoke and its residents and its voters for its feedback. Uh, I continue to want to hear, and I know you guys are going to get feedback from your constituents and residents. And just to hear what the public wants. It's non-binding. So even if it does make it on the ballot, it wouldn't force that to happen. I want to gauge the community's interest, and I think we've done that on other issues like town manager, no town manager, um, and some other issues, but it's just to gauge what the public thinks, and that's my thought process. I'll open up to committee members and any member of the public who's here to speak on behalf of it. Is there anyone from the public first? Yeah, is there anyone from the public? Uh, yeah. yeah. I'll represent the, uh, the public tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Dave Yost, 20 Sydney Avenue, and uh, maybe somewhat surprisingly, I'm in, in favor of this. Um, I think the root of a lot of the problems, uh, present company accepted, of course, but uh, the problems of having city government and, and the city in general, I think really at the root of it is we have so so little involvement. In our last election, what we had 30% turnout, so that means uh, you know whoever was elected with a small majority only got the vote to 16 or 17% of the public. So I think, uh, you know, 16, when they start driving, is a good age for our young people to start getting involved. You know, they get in the habit of voting. And uh, as Councilor Rowan mentioned, it's perfectly constitutional. That just set a, 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 a minimum age. We can't, we can't make it higher than 18, but there's nothing to stop us from going lower. And uh, what else? Well, and I think young people are also very, I mean, they're very open-minded. You know, if they make, if they make a, a bad decision in, the, in an election, they're more willing to uh, go back and rethink it and vote for somebody else the next time. And I hear a lot of per people are concerned about somehow the uh, young people all turn out en, en masse and, and somehow swing the election. I mean, I don't think there's really enough, but even if that's the case, if it shamed the adults into coming out and voting, I mean, that wouldn't be such a bad thing and the only the the uh the other thing i'd add kind of i don't know a friendly amendment if we had a in, in the constitution we in the federal constitution we have minimum ages for for holding office not to get elected but to actually take an office it's 25 for congress and 35 for president i mean i'd like to see it at 40 but i I'd, I'd settle for 25 so <laughs> that might be something to consider adding to that proposal but overall, I think it's a good idea to get uh, get people in the habit, get get young people in the habit of voting younger, and hopefully they'll continue that uh, because you know our our community compared to other communities where people where voter turnout is higher, we see you know the economic conditions really the the whole state of our community seems to be a little better than ours is right now. So this this would be a good initiative to help with that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and then quickly before I hand it off to my colleagues, I would just note that again, in light of recent events and again, tragic events in Florida, we've seen young people show up in a miraculous way and they have been for a while, but I just, it's really exciting to see young people stand up for whatever point of the issue they feel and you know, whatever is going to happen on a national level, just seeing kids go to the state house in Florida or to DC or have the town hall last night. I was watching town hall on CNN and watching young brilliant minds, 15, 16, 14, ask very poignant questions and really grasp these issues, I think it'll be cool to have. So I'll open it up to the committee members. And again, we're not going to take this issue and finalize it tonight. 
I'd like to continue the public hearing. I've got, like I said, two or three emails that I want to forward to the committee members, very thoughtful arguments, not just Tide Pod arguments, but real arguments for for or against that I think we should consider. And it's great to have this conversation. So I'll open it up to any committee members or any counselors who want to speak on it. Well, if we're going to continue it. Oh, well, yeah. Okay, well, and then take it back up at that point. You got Were it. there people that said they wanted to come tonight that couldn't make it? Yeah, so there was like the Holyoke Herald, some of their teens wanted to come and like neighbor to neighbors having their monthly meeting and there's some other people who just wanted to, you know. All right, then why don't we, why don't we just table it because there's other members that want to come in and speak. Give them the right to speak. On it. Sounds good. That's what the sure, that's yeah. fine with me. All right, so the motion's been made and seconded to table. Uh, we have to table to a date certain, right? Because it's public second. hearing. Uh, uh, yes, indeed. Um, so I was actually proposing, I love this new calendar, Mr. President. I must say it's top notch in the back. I love it. Yeah. Oh, no, it's back there, though. I already tried. So I was looking at the committee members to see if we could, for March, meet council meets the 20th, if Monday the 19th works for you all, if you have a Monday. The 19th, does that work for you? Does that work for you, Mr. President? Uh, wait, Monday, Joe, you know what I mean? Monday for finance? For March? I saw finance at March, the beginning of the month. March 12th, yeah, we'll I know, I used the calendar. It was Just good. Sure. <laughs> yeah. 6.30, right? Yes. Oh. So my legs will be tired, Counselor. <laughs> so, um... <laughs> I'll take lots of hauls. So date certain continuation to March 19th at 6.30. At 6.30. We'll take it right up at the beginning of the evening and allow other members of the public to come in that wanted to come in and speak and young people and everyone's welcome to speak on this issue. So well, that, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? One, one question. Mm -hmm. um, how are we getting this out to the public? I know Mike, Mike's always here. What's another way of getting it out so people know that they can come down and speak on this? So Are we putting it on Facebook? Now that I have the dates earned, I'm going to do a Facebook. I'm going to mail it out. The Holyoke Herald is going to write a story on this. I'll get it out to the Latino newspapers, right. and we'll get it out there. So that's why I know. thank Mr. Yash for coming down, but, you know, seeing other other groups there. Yeah. You know, what other way can we get it out there to, to make sure people can come in and speak? Exactly. That's why you and I, Mr. President, just for the record, wanted to create a city council Facebook page. You know, we got shut down. Oh, Man. I said Facebook page loosely. We have enough things to manage with the website. <laughs> I was ready for that social media page. No, stop. Just kidding. Just kidding. A little light humor. All right. Motion I to think take. The, the president of the city council should be on Twitter. I agree. <laughs> Talk about hitting young voters. You got to get on Twitter. <laughs> All right, motion to take up and open the public hearing for item number four. So moved. All right, item number four is uh, filed by Council Roman. Ordered that the city council review and hold public hearing on rules of the city council and make any recommendations for changes to the public rules document. I think we'd better label this 4A because the previous item was 4. We will label it 4A. Thank you so much for catching that. Leave it 4A. Yep. I second it. All those in favor? Aye. So it's 4A. Um, did we get the latest printout after we made those final changes? I gave you guys the oh. final version. Of, of the rules? rules? Yes, let me go yeah. grab it real quick. Yeah, I, I handed them out. They came from Brenda, right? Yeah. From the... Maybe it was, that was the email. Because I had a... Hang on. Let's see what I've got in here. Updated December 11, 2017. I like that. Go, Mr. President. The reason why I filed this order was again during that same time frame where we were taking everything up. There were just minor things, and again, we're going to probably continue to certain. And I had heard from members of the public who wanted to look at our rules and make sure they're online and so on and so forth. But just simple stuff, for example, Rule 26, where it kind of lays out our meeting agenda. 
I just wanted that to exactly match what we usually do on our agenda. <laughs> so for example, it's like roll call the members pre pre pledge of allegiance, which we usually do, presentations, reports, and invitations. Then down here it has presentations, petitions, memorials, and remembrances. We usually always do that at the beginning of the meeting anyway. So just to clean that up and move it up so they both happen one after the other because that's how we usually do it anyway. If it's a moment of silence or if it's a, someone's passed on. And then usually we do take up minutes and we take any correspondence second, then comes public comment, then comes the president report. Well, this is in order. You got the roll call, your president's notifications would go up. to finish business would be stuff like laid on the table. So that would be next on the agenda. I'm just trying to pull up one of our agendas to look at. So agenda. So, sorry, just to pull it up so we can, so. This is our agenda from, so public comment is listed at the very top. So for February 20th, 2018, public comment was listed first. So we usually do Pledge of Allegiance. Well, you don't, you don't list. But it's in our rules, so then I'm just trying to match that document. So after the first part of what's <laughs> called, shouldn't that match what's on the agenda? We don't, every it doesn't have to be meeting, written. It says, at every regular meeting of the council, the order of business shall be as follows. Roll call. Mm -hmm. Right. Do. But it doesn't well, have to be don't written have on to there. Put it on the, the agenda in and of itself is what is being taken up that day. This is the order of the meeting to start the meeting, not so much the agenda. saying order of meeting and agenda. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we're going to be, if, if we want to clean up, we can say at every regular meeting of the council, the order of the business and the agenda should follow. If you want to do it that way, and that would maybe tidy up the language, but... I was just trying to say, because I have gotten feedback from the public, that they say they look at this, and it doesn't match the agenda that goes out to the The agenda is different from this. this, in the sense of, this is saying when we start the, the council meeting, take the roll call, make sure everyone's here. You don't really necessarily put that in the agenda, say roll call. Yeah. I mean, we could. No, I mean, no, yeah. You're... One thing you have to remember is, with our agenda, and, and I, I really think we should get in here. Uh, I actually was given the opportunity to sit down with it because she would always say, every time we make a recommendation to do something with the agenda, you have to understand that the, the agenda was built by someone outside and it's in a module. So just saying, hey, you got to do this, you can't just do that to the agenda. They have to redesign it to, to fit it and make it work. So when we said, hey, let's do the late files, when the late files come in, and add them, just put them on the agenda. You can't, that's why we had to go to the Word document, and now the Word document gets... Right, I, I, mean, some, yeah. I, I think it would be really beneficial to have her come in and tell us and show us how that agenda works, and and then right away we'll see why there's certain issues to it. Well, but if we need an end result, it's just figuring out how to accomplish it. Yeah. Yeah, really. and that's but, just one of the examples. And yeah, like but, I said, I know members of the public had other minor things and like, and our standing committees are updated, which is great. Um, and I forget all the little specifics right now, but there was others who had made comments that they would love to look into our rules and give feedback. And Are these not online? Because we asked if they'd be put online. I believe today I saw a correspondence from the law department asking for the latest up-to-date ones because these aren't online. All right. Like, uh, Crystal asked for these, for the most up-to-date ones, because she doesn't have the most up-to-date to make sure they're online. I think she has the one before this <laughs> event. Let's ask Ryan, uh, well, no, I'll tell the Who clerks. Who puts those up? Yeah. The, clerk, the clerk's office? Clerk's or? office. So we'll just tell oh. the clerk's office. Yeah. And then I'll or like, for example, in here, it says that there's supposed to be like a list of every like order that's in the jacket somewhere online. It still has the document on our website from like orders from 2012, 2013. So like, you know, just making sure that we're following the rules. and. But yeah, I, like I said, I just wanted to open it up and hear if anyone from the public wanted to make suggestions or changes. So, or if you all, 
Because remember, we couldn't take up the entire document because we had just very specific ones. Are they, but I guess, so right now, the rules themselves are not posted online? The most up-to-date ones, right, so I think. Oh, so it just needs to be updated mm -hmm. with the amendments that we made. And I just, if I can. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, That's right. I would just like to clarify, these rules are our internal rules for the operation of the city council itself. Mm -hmm. No, it's true. It's not an ordinance. It is the rules by which we decide how we are running our meetings and such. But to your point, if we're making a rule, then we should keep the rule. Of course, some of the rules are impossible to keep. So <laughs> yeah, and again, we like might want to look at that because, um, for example, under there, we say we're going to take up every order within 30 days that comes into a committee. Yeah. And well, exactly. that has never happened, happened in the history of the ordinance committee. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so. and other committees, too. I know even when I was on the joint committee, there's some things that I just couldn't get to. Or like, you know, and so for me, and that's exactly one of the orders I do want to dig into here is not, and I know I, I said that word die, but I think that you should have to, like, after X amount, if something's in there, with all due respect, Mr. President, but from 2012 and it hasn't been brought up, well, no, no, it, it was it brought up several times. Uh, no, no, yeah, but with other items, like if there's just there for forever, like I remember we were taking up last ta last term in this committee stuff from Gordon Alexander and right. from like- I still have things in the ordinance jacket from him. Yeah, exactly. So th in my instance, after X amount of days, if it's past the two year term where we're in council, then someone should either have to refile or those mm -hmm. should go away automatically I because that's so. not fair for the committee chairs because we are, you know, you do get it a data. We had that discussion though, and it was, we did dis discuss that rule change. Yeah. And, they don't go away. And they're, <laughs> at the state level, they go away. At the local level, they never go away. And I think but we, should, we had that yeah. discussion mm -hmm. the last time, and it wasn't the will of the body to change that, but if you know. If there's certain rules that, I mean, we did a good job uh, with Joe addressing some of the rules, changing some of the committees and numbers. Mm. Um, I think public comment was tweaked in order to mm -hmm. uh, address what some people had asked for. So a lot was done. Does that mean we're done with it? No, we can keep making tweaks along the way. So if there's a certain rule we want, especially the 30 day one, if we want to file an order on that one, let's file an order and say, is 30 days enough? Or you have to at least take it up and 45 days, and then you can table it, and but you have to, after a table, you have to take it up in 30 days. However you want to tweak yeah. it, let's file an order to do that. But I think this is going to allow us to go through the whole document, because when we did the specific orders, you have to just stay on that yeah. order, and that was the problem last time, that's why I filed this, to allow all the committee members to look through exactly like Councilor Bacon was saying, or like me from the public, or the next, you know, two down, because I know we're going to get into um, the solicitor next, but when we're talking about allowing public comment for all committees like we see community members come in being very specific like we do for public comment for the council that is for what I heard from the public like setting aside five minutes at the beginning of any meeting so just like we do for city council but this will allow us to look at the full document and in the case said like I said that's a good recommendation you made to get the clerk in here to say hey and I'm just saying for for that specific not to just harp on item 26 even though this is the internal document of the city council if I'm Oh my God, I'm going to use a Kevin Jordanism. If I'm Sally Q. Public and I'm going on the city council website or I'm Joe, Jolton Joe McGivern and I'm, you know, on the city website looking at the city council rules and if someone says, hey, their internal rules say that they're supposed to go from, you know, presentations and reports and invitation of the council to public comment, but then they want to do president's report, that doesn't follow the rules you know, to the public, and so we could just clean it up or get that from the clerk so it matches. This is just simple, it's just matching what it matches with hers and then we're fine, because then you could just do that. Or um, in other sections too, like uh, for a petition, like what happens with a petition? If people come in with a citizen's petition to the council, you know, I heard also from the public and feedback, what's the streamlined process? So I think, you know, again, we're gonna table this to a date certain, maybe next month, just to look through the whole document, because now we have that authority to look through the entire document. And even like we just said, this specific order around orders coming up within a certain time frame, going away in a certain time frame, or if they pass it, I think of the term, if after two years we haven't taken it up, it's, you know, we, we sign it off that it's gone and someone has to refile it and then we clear it out, we make it transparent, 
we bring it up you know to the council maybe our final meeting before the term ends say these are all the orders and resolutions that it, you know so it doesn't get anyone mad maybe they just they're complied with before the end of our term and then they go away and someone has to file them again and that's just a rule so uh, yeah I think that we're gonna need time to dig deep and you know I want to hear from the public again too and maybe I'll invite the city clerk in and even have the law department take a look at this have you guys taken a look at this yet either or to yeah Can you come to the mic? Sorry. <laughs> Broadcasting. Yeah, you have a mic at the desk, Paul. You don't gotta. We've upgraded <laughs> thanks to this new council. <laughs> Look at that. Not you know. Not that I don't talk loud enough as it is. Uh, no, but I, I I thought this this was a great order. Um, you know, looking at the rules. Um, you know, myself sometimes with a lot of things. You know, it doesn't match up to what. Um, you know the, the practices. I, I think that happens with a lot of you know different things. So it's worth having a fresh look and um, uh, be happy to provide some comment with that. Talk with Crystal and and, and see what uh, this was a good idea. So <laughs> and another one. I know all of the members in the body are guilty. Me and Linda not so much, but they definitely talk more than two times in a row. So maybe we give them a third courtesy. <clears throat> No, 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 you've been very good. I mean, one slipped by you last meeting, Mr. President, but I'll let that go. Um, however, I think maybe we should adjust that and allow members three times to speak. You know, like, I, I mean, I don't know. We could dig deep into it, but for now, I'll just entertain a motion to table until... Oh, public comment. I'm so sorry. Yes, it's a public comment. I'm, I'm striking out on my first chairmanship here. No, no, no. no. <laughs> yeah, just uh, just from the, the a few things from the public's perspective, I mean... I, I like this format in the subcommittee when we can comment individually in each uh, each agenda item. But I think if we did that at a full council meeting, we'd be. We're, sometimes we're here past midnight anyway. I think we'd be to four in the morning if we if we did that. But uh, at the full council, if we had the public made sure the public comment was right at the beginning, because I remember a few occasions. I think most recently, and we had the vote on the CPA member. We didn't have the public comment till after after the vote, so I didn't get a chance to speak in favor of my preferred candidate. And I think the other thing, if we could have a, a, <clears throat> an updated agenda with all the, the late file items posted somewhere, may, maybe on that Facebook page. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree. That's a, maybe that's, again, that's a thank you so much, uh, Mr. Yost. Pop. Um, just full transparency, he's like my adopted dad, so I call him Pop for the public. Um, but I agree, like, if we're having it in a Word document, maybe getting that on the city's website within, you know, even if it's the day of, so the public can see and print out and have a copy of our late file orders and communications that come out all the time as we get mad about within the 24 hours and stuff like that. Okay, so... Well, if we did post them before the meeting, then we wouldn't have to post them after the meeting. Sure. Sure. Um, so motion to um, or, uh, entertain a motion to table. Well, table it to the 19th because you're doing a public hearing, yep. right? 19th, and we'll do what, 7 Second. No, say 6.30 for both. 6.30 for both. Okay, perfect. Motion has been made and second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Hearing none. Motion and entertain a motion to motion take, to up take up item 5. Motion to take up item 5. Five, five, five so right? Yeah. Seconded. Yep. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Item number five, introduced by Councilor McGee, um, ordered that the city solicitor come before the city council to give an update on open meeting law changes. For example, emails, replying all to emails, et cetera, et cetera. And so, Paul, we did get your email at 602. I tried to print it out, but if you have handouts. Page printed. Oh, come on in. Do you have extras enough to give Mike one? Mike a set? That's okay, I'll share with Linda, so if you want to just give Mike for the open meeting stuff. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so I'll let Councilor McGee kind of kick us off, and then we'll open it up to you, Paul, and you, we can have this discussion. Thank you so much for coming in tonight. I appreciate Absolutely. you being here. And Councilor McGee. Yeah, I, I know Paul sent out an email a few months back, right, Paul, saying that there were some changes. And then, two, every now and then, it, it's not all the time, but it, it does come up where um, someone has a question on something, and they send it out to the council. And it, it really is innocent. 
you know, hey, what about this as a piece of information? I'll send it to reply all, and everyone's firing back on each other. And we have learned that that is an open media violation. Um, so we're just trying to make sure, you know, no one really does to do things intentionally, but sometimes, you know, there are rules that say you, even though it's innocent, you're, you're violating it. So I think it's good for us to have you come in and just say, here's some of the new changes. We've seen some of those bad things. This is how you have to do it. Now it's on record. We can report it back and hopefully just keep reminding ourselves of what yeah, to do absolutely. and not to do. And, you know, even uh, to the prior item, um, you know, reducing uh, uh, some of, uh, uh, you know, the more sort of complicated interpretations to a, you know, city council rule. And then, you know, it reflects what the open meeting law says on email communications, which is, um, which is a bit complicated. I think that um, in front of you is a FAQ, which is just taken from the, um, uh, the open meeting law website, which is actually a really great resource. Some government websites might not have a lot of information, might be tough to navigate, but the open meeting law website uh, has a wealth of information, all the determinations, uh, guidance documents, um, and so forth. Uh, but this FAQ sort of outlines, you know, some of the situations that arise with email as well as an emerging issue, which is social media. Um, uh, there's actually two recent decisions uh, just this past year from the open, uh, from, from the uh, Attorney General's Office uh, Division of Open Government um, that has uh, reflected that uh, a Facebook post itself, even if you're friends with everybody on the council, doesn't violate the open meeting law because you are communicating with the general public. But in those two decisions, you sort of see division of open government kind of struggling with how to how to address this difficult issue. So uh, taking a step back to your original point, uh, President McGee, um, is uh, uh, when you have the situation with uh, a reply all. I think the important thing to um, take away is that uh, this idea of a serial communication. So if I send three counselors or, uh, you know, if Councillor Roman sends three other counselors a, an email uh, sharing some thoughts and some policies, that doesn't violate the open meeting law. It's not to a quorum of the body. But if that's sent forwarded to another four counselors, that constitute a violation, even if the original communication was to a narrow group. So uh, that is the, the sort of, I think, most um, most difficult situation to track and the most likely to be an inadvertent violation uh, is, is when that's getting forwarded along. Um, but the general, the general rule, uh, you know, the entire body can exchange documents, agenda, uh, communications, uh, any of the materials that are discussed. It's just uh, expressing an opinion on it uh, is, is what triggers the uh, deliberation. Yeah, when, a lot of times uh, I'll get a, a communication from a department. Um, here, can you give this to your fellow counselors. Mm -hmm. Right away, I just want to forward and send to everyone. So I've taken a step back learning from what happened to another counselor uh, about a year and a half ago. I now require department heads or anyone who's sending me something, I say, thank you for the, the uh, information. Please send it to the clerk. Have the clerk stamp it and then have her or her staff send it out to the full body. So in that way, it's coming from the clerk's office in order not to be coming from me to then create reply alls and that type of stuff. So that's one thing I've done in order to try and avoid issues. Am I overprotecting myself? Or should I just forward it off to people? Well, I, mean, I think what you're doing in that instance is you wouldn't be, nobody would be violating the open meeting law if you then forwarded it to everybody in the body and nobody... Without comment, right? Exactly. It's that... Um, that reply that says this is a great idea. Which no, I this is from this is from Paul. Uh, this is from our solicitor information. Now he writes back, 
well, I don't agree with this. Joe Rice back up. Exactly. Near, near kind of caught. So that's why I'm saying is the best course for us to just say, if you have a communication, send it through the clerk. or I, I, That's what I'm trying to look for. We just don't want someone to come firing back at us, report us, and then now we're, now we're, we're trying to say, hey, look, I thought I was doing it right, and now I'm... Yeah, I mean, I think this is a tough one because in thinking about uh, this topic uh, this evening, you want to encourage communication. Right. You want to encourage dialogue. So in that example, um, you know, uh, city solicitor sends something to uh, Councillor McGee. Councillor McGee forwards it to the whole group. Councillor Roman thinks this is a terrible idea and wants to let the city solicitor know right away. Sounds like you. Councillor Roman can shoot me an email and say, "Well, what's going on here?" Um, that's okay uh, because that's not a deliberation with a quorum of the body. That's you know, and I think that's sometimes what gets lost with this is is um, uh, you know. The open meeting law is is not meant to be stifling communication. It's just saying that what's happening right now should happen here, you know, uh, not on a phone conference where we're talking about this. Um, so uh, I, I think that uh, uh, you know maybe some of the things that'd be helpful for me to kind of think about is is what would be a good way to present this information to the council, and I'm thinking that. Uh, hypotheticals or examples of maybe hitting on the top five things where you know counselors get frustrated because they're feel like they can't you know touch base with a city official or uh, share a thought with one of their you know uh, colleagues uh, when those activities are entirely permissible uh, under the open meeting law uh, that could be a good way to clarify does the state roadblocks. give us any type of disclaimers like I get a communication from you or some other department head and I say forward off to get to everyone so I don't have to go through the process of getting to the clerk and have the clerk do all more work. I forward off but then in my email I say this is for communication purposes only. Please do not reply all to this if you have a specific question for the person doing the communication follow up with them. Now if someone does reply all at least the person forwarding off the information is protected. Does the state answer that type of issue? Do they do they give you disclaimers to put in your email to protect yourself? I'm not sure. I mean, that's a good idea, though. And um, and certainly, I think it's the sort of thing that if we're all aware of it, you have that disclaimer in there. And if there is a violation, if you know, we just say, hey, by the way, uh, you know, we can't discuss this as a group. I, you know, the attorney, if a complaint was filed on that, the attorney general's office would be like, well, you know inadvertent they immediately corrected it um, so I think that would be a helpful way to kind of put everybody on notice Councilor Bacon thanks so I think um, just to follow up on Councilor McGee for a minute I think if you if somebody answered you and you didn't answer them you wouldn't be having debate on the matter so it's you know would have to be a more than one Actually, to have a debate if you're putting something out that's just strictly informational and somebody answers you as long as you don't pick up the ball then I would think you wouldn't be debating or discussing you can you can have a deliberation with one opinion expressed uh, so as long as one member but, but to your point receiving the information wouldn't be an issue but uh, if there's Answering if there is it, correct just one response would, would do it and um, just to follow up um, on that, but in a little different way, um, I've long had concerns and actually filed an order on this um, with people communicating amongst members of the council during the council meetings and communicating with members of the public by um, text and emails during the public meeting, that that is in some way a violation of the open meeting law where we're supposed to be having whatever debates and discussion that we're having in the public, with the public hearing it. 
and I would like you to speak to us on that. I was kind of laughed out of the room when I filed the order about four or five years ago, but it remains a concern of mine. What was the uh, the order? Was it for a city council rule or? Yes, yeah. the order that I filed was for a city council rule that people would not be using their cell phones during the council meetings for communication purposes. Yeah. Because I see no need for it. There's no reason why any communication that needs to take place during the city council meeting needs to be otherwise than on the microphone. But um, I was roundly <laughs> opposed in that regard, but I remain concerned. The last two questions on the, the FAQ uh, address, uh, address this, and it, it's, it's an interesting point. Um, so the, the uh, fourth question says that members of public bodies uh, who are physically present texting to communicate with other members during the meeting is not a violation of the open meeting law, but then it goes on to say that, well, although it's not a violation of the open meeting law, best practice would be to to avoid the use. Um, so it would be something that, um, uh, you know, again, doesn't violate the open meeting law, but could be subject to a rule or, you know, uh, guidance or practice from the, the, the body. So between the people at the meeting is one thing, but what about people communicating with people outside of the meeting that are watching the meeting that wish to influence the meeting and are directly communicating with counselors where the people sitting in the chamber don't have the opportunity to directly communicate with us because they're not allowed. So sorry, I think I had those mixed up there. So, so that fourth one down is talking about communicating with members of the public uh, not uh, other members of the public body. So members of the public would be something that's not uh, an open meeting law violation, uh, but could be regulated otherwise. Uh, discussion between uh, uh, texting another city councilor during a meeting, is that the scenario? It's both. Yeah, so I think they're handled separately. So uh, separate from the situation where a councilor is texting somebody uh, who's a non-elected member of the public versus, in which case that's okay, that's permissible under the open meeting law versus a situation where two counselors are texting. Um, you know, I think this, the, the last question sort of gets to a, uh, a maybe. So there's a lot of, it's okay for me to say maybe, and it's a gray area because the state <laughs> is saying the same thing. So it's something that could constitute an open meeting law violation I think the reality that they're recognizing here is that um, it's going to be uh, difficult to uh, to show that. I mean, to to demonstrate it. So it's uh, um, it's something I don't think there's a lot of decisions on, both because it's a technology thing, it's something it's a new application, but also um, because it's uh, by its nature is uh, tough to determine. Well. I will, I, I will just make a comment that I think it's ironic that if you were doing it with an email, it would be a violation, but if you're doing it with texting, it isn't. I just you know, find that a little contradictory in the spirit of transparency and having the communications of, pertaining to the public being public. That's just my perspective on it. So, But we could create a rule if we chose to. I mean, I don't think the will is there unless the attitude has changed over the years, but. I'm there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Paul, really quick before I go to Councilor McGivern. So um, in this, it says that if members of the body, so for example, there's this forum that exists now called, run by one of our members, um, and people engage in dialogue and debate. Mm -hmm. So you're saying if under the comments, two or three or four counselors engage in that dialogue and the debate, that's a violation. So this is a tough one, and, and I have I haven't made copies of this, but I can. I didn't want to throw too much paper at you. I kind of wanted to get an idea of what the questions uh, the questions were. But um, there's two decisions. Uh, I can give the citation just for folks at home uh, or anybody interested. Uh, it's OML 2017-192 and OML 2017-111. Um, both of these are the first 
open meeting law determinations to address Facebook, it really is a gray area. So I'm, I'm very cautious to, um, to wade into it further than what's stated here. Uh, in both of these instances, there was a Facebook post that was made to the general public and the Attorney General's office is saying, we're gonna look at the intent. So if the intent was to share some information to the public and it happened that you know every member of the city council saw that, um, which is the fact pattern in these, they said, that's okay, it's not a violation. What didn't happen here and what is a good question is what you raised, uh, Councilman Roman, is what if all 12 other members hit like or commented on it? And uh, that's, that's an open question. Um, I think the last comment that was made in the, um, the most recent decision said that recognizing that it may be difficult to determine whether communication constitutes deliberation under the open meeting law, our office cautions public bodies on the use of Facebook and other social media, um, and then references the FAQ uh, that we have uh, before us. Uh, I, I'd say as a general practice, to avoid it, uh, you know, having conversation in the comments on any public matter that's before the body, I would recommend not doing that. But again, at the same time, it's, uh, you know, understandably it's a gray area and you don't want to unduly stifle public conversation. So the, with social media, if the objective is the intent is to be communicating with the general public, that's, that's a good thing. If you're liking another post, you're really kind of communicating with the poster in a sense. So I think that's where it would get rocky. And then one final, it's really a thought, but I have been doing this, so can you just give me an opinion if you think I'm doing this correctly? Because I have equally Maybe. been as nervous around sending emails to all my colleagues at once, but even for me asking them who's going to co-file or not, if I'm busy in a crazy day and I need to... You're asking for support of an order that you're filing. Open meeting law violation. So hold on, let me, if I could ask him, please, former chair, I'm the chair, I got the floor. Um, so what, I, I, do, what I do is, is I back carbon copy everyone and I don't say, what I, what I tell the clerk's office is, here are my orders for the meeting. I have back carbon copied my colleagues. They cannot directly respond to each other. And I tell the clerk's office, if anyone wants to be added as a co-sponsor, they will email you directly and CC me asking that permission because that's the decorum that we follow and then I would sign on to that individual counselor saying of course they could be added because the clerk's office won't add them unless the original or originator says they can be added but I BCC them they don't interact with each other they they will respond back to me sometimes the clerk's office but I just want to make sure I'm on the up and up and that I'm not exactly yeah. like my colleague saying I'm not violating open meeting laws. So, so if I understand, uh, you have an order uh, that you're looking to file, uh, you BCC the I'm the sending it to the clerk's office, but I'm BCCing the, the membership. Office, uh, and, and then in the body of that email saying... Uh, if my colleagues want to sign on, they're going to email you directly and CC me on it. Not sure. I'd have to think about that because I, I can see the argument that would be that you're communicating, but at the same time you're stating what the process or procedure is. Um, I, I don't know, Councilor McGivern, have you encountered that or? We just never hit reply all. Yeah. Well, you can't. So when you BCC someone, right. there's only reply. So they'll only reply to me. And so if they hit reply all, they're only going to reply to me because they're back carbon copy. They won't be able to access any of the other members of the body. So that's, and it is gray. Yeah. I'm being transparent. I want to ask because they all know they laugh at me sometimes on like, if the deadline's Thursday, Wednesday night at one in the morning, <laughs> Nelson's up typing away. When they wake up Thursday before the deadline, they'll read it in their email. That's just how I've done. And they, they do, they laugh at me like, Nelson, why were you up so late last night? But it's what I do. <laughs> so I just want to make sure that I'm being clear and transparent and not violating. Yeah, I mean, I, that, that does sound, uh, that does sound fine. I mean, the intent, but if you could just check on it, cause if yeah. not, I'll stop and email them individually if I have to. I think, I think the way we have done it is if you're going to file an order and someone wants to sign on, you, you file an order and you BCC saying, if you want to sign on, please tell the clerk's office, right? You're not, 
asking for it. You're just saying, if you would like to, it's your opportunity. You have to go through the clerk. So you're trying to segregate yourself from it. Mm. The real issue does does become if you don't BC and someone starts to reply all, you go right into what Joe was trying to say is that is a violation of the old mean law. So it, it's really, it, it, it's very catchy. In the sense <coughs> I don't think anyone on this board wants to do it wrong, but the problem is with with everything we're talking about, there's a, a big gray area, and we're just trying to make sure we're fully up front that if we were to violate it, it's never the intent, we just want to make sure we're not you know, bash for it or, you know, uh, attorney generals coming in screaming at us and sanctioning us. That's, that's kind of where we're trying to make sure we're full disclosure. Council McGivern. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, did, Linda's former order and her earlier comments, Linda, I never laughed at what you said. I, I, I really do believe we should not, should not be texting each other about what we're debating in public while we're debating it. Um, that, that, I think, and if it doesn't violate the open meeting law, it should. Because the, the idea of the open meeting law is not just to be in the open meeting, but the idea is that we can rebut each other as to what we say and what we stand for, and the public hears all of what we say and what we stand for. We're the public, as long as not just the other side of the rail. Inside the rail, we still are part of the public, and our comments need to be heard by everyone so that us we're going to take the votes can rebut comments and the public can if not during the meeting at a future time or make note rebut what we said or how we voted um text how are banning a, a, a any you know iphone or laptops are even more common these days you know as people are working because they are good tools in the ordinance committee meeting i google map every special permit every zone change you know and DGR, I'm often Googling Mass General Laws in Finance Committee. Just doing it by memory, Todd, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, you, you need them. But at the same time, they, they should not be abused. Um, going back to what Todd was saying, Paul, is on the informational thing. I, I think the informational thing is the hardest one because we, we need to get information in a timely fashion. Whether it comes to the president, I think it's a lot easier for, or a lot smoother if it comes to the city clerk's office, not necessarily on the agenda. And that's what the city clerk has a problem with. If it's given to her office, she often puts it on the agenda instead of just trying to forward it so that we can have it, you know, up front and be the, uh, be the uh, distribution, you know, so to speak. But it, it is hard when, when the president gets so much to be, to be passed on to do it. And once you hit reply all or reply, there's a thread that starts. Um, I, I do whether it's necessary or not, I just hit reply. I think some people, but sometimes a chair will, will go to the members of the committee, can you meet on such and such a date? You want to see yes or no as a committee. So you can say, yes, I can, no, I can't. All right, Todd can't meet this date, but Linda can meet this date. And it helps everybody get that common date you know, together. Um, Nelson, I think the, the most the part about the whole open meeting law is what you were talking about and you know the, the simple stuff becomes the complicated stuff you know and, and that's as soon as as Paul said as soon as deliberation begins the open meeting law is is violated that is the common sense and that's that's you know it might be as simple as saying do you want to sign on to this you know just a courtesy and I, 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 I reply back, no, I don't believe in this. I just debated. I broke the open meeting law, you know, although I was just responding to your courtesy. But if, you know, all of the other members of the city council saw that, that violated the open meeting law. So it's, there, there's no simple answer. And, uh, and I thank Paul for coming down this evening. I wish there were more members here to hear this. Um, I'm sure you're going to give them a good, uh, a good synopsis of the uh, summary of uh, the open meeting law next uh, two weeks. But on the other hand, it is, uh, it's always good to refresh our memories that it's an important law to abide by and to always be careful with. Thank you. Any other committee members? Wait. Well, there was changes for October, starting October 2017. Are there major changes that we should be aware of? Or I know there's a bunch of 
lined out stuff and do language. <coughs> is there stuff we should be aware of with the changes? Yeah, the uh, the lined out the, the the track changes thing. You know, that's kind of uh, the the long sl the long slog of it there. Uh, but this uh, two or three page document here um, gives a good summary of, of what has been changed. Uh, the the biggest um, the biggest changes are. Um, uh, the notice posting requirement has been changed uh, to allow a municipality. It used to be that, um, well, the notice posting uh, was changed to allow the website to be the official method, which is useful because well, it is, um, and that's something that was adopted um, uh, back in uh, October or November. Um, the other change that was made uh, that I, you know, I just found interesting um, was uh, 2910 uh, to remote participation, and uh, I find it interesting. I'm not expressing whether it's a good idea or a bad idea for any particular board, um, but it's uh, it's just a reflection of how technology is sort of interacting with. Um, uh, changes in the law, uh, and this would allow remote participation. And as I recall, it, it took the standard down um, from uh, uh, documenting the reasons for why remote participation would be allowed. It, it makes it a little bit more flexible. Um, so, just sort of an interesting. So I can get one of those new machines. It's got like an iPad face. Can <laughs> I can have it sit up there? I think that's that would be a great April first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that idea, uh, having some folks from Skyping in to give some uh, feedback. Uh, this is perfect. Well, not for our members, but thank you so much, Paul. Absolutely. And then um, just to follow up quickly, because Councilor McGivern actually brought it up. So then exactly that, committee chairs communicate with their committee members. Is that a violation? When we decide on our meeting times and dates, and no, to to clarify that, so scheduling uh, agenda, oh, debating, sort of all issues. that stuff's okay. Okay, yeah. good. Well, and, good to and, know. Just uh, in case any of the colleagues ask, I just wanted to clarify. Right, but Mr. Chairman, yes. we do have to be careful now that we're a committee of three. Mm -hmm. Two of us talking to each other is a quorum. <laughs> yeah. Don't That's call me, problem. guys. Don't call me. <laughs> Don't call me. Okay. We never leave. No, Why? all right. Thank you so much, Paul. Absolutely. I really appreciate Thank it. You. Any Have other members? Night. So um, I'll entertain a motion. Motion is that it's complied with. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul, for Thanks. coming in tonight. I realize I'm busier committees how much I'm writing my hands starting now, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, all right, um, I'll entertain motion to take item a six. item. Oh, second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Item number six is ordered that the city council amend its rules to add public comment as part of all committee meetings, allowing members of the public the opportunity to speak <coughs> at all committee meetings. So this was filed by me. Again, similar process. I know that we have to suspend the rules, take it up. Not that we've seen a huge influx of the public come to our subcommittee meetings lately. I just think if it's there and they have the opportunity to sign up and for us to keep track, because the other thing I was, and I actually noticed this in our regular meeting minutes, we're in our written minutes not keeping track of who from the public is speaking their names and addresses. So even though we're asking for it, and I know Ryan has the printed out list, in our public minutes they're not there. Oh wow. <laughs> so they're not showing up. I know we write it down because I sit next, well I used to sit next to Linda I feel so far, but I know Linda's very thorough where she writes everyone's name and address, but in our minutes that we get, they're not there. If they're, if they're not there. So I just think, again, we should limit it. It should be no longer than five minutes at the beginning because then anyone can get out what they have to say. They get up to a minute, you can have up to five speakers max. And then if you need to go above and beyond, you can suspend the rules. That's just my suggestion and recommendation just as a way to allow anyone who has to come in or wants to speak on a committee matter, they can, and it allows the public a chance to speak. Just my thoughts. Councilor Bacon. Thank you. Um, I have a concern about this, and I'm a fan of transparency in government. I'm a fan of being responsive to the people who elect us. What I'm concerned about is my observation is there's usually three to five people who are all the same people who come to the committee meetings. And I think we're giving 
because of the way it has actually evolved, um, a lot of influence to very few people who take advantage of that opportunity. Now, and I'm not saying that what they're doing is wrong or bad or anything else. It's just that the people elect us to represent them. And I'm a little concerned that we're digging into that by sort of creating a public hearing of every meeting. Uh, we do suspend our rules and most chairs are very generous and flexible with doing that when members of the public are um, very interested or engaged in a particular issue. But I don't know, it just feels like a slippery slope on opening it up. And on ordinance committee, we usually have 10 to 15 agenda items there. We will suspend rules. I, I can't say I've seen a meeting where we didn't if people came down for a particular interest. And I think in general, everybody's pretty flexible that way. But I, and I don't know if I'm just having a reaction, you know what I mean? So I don't want to come across like I don't want people to speak. On the other hand, there is something that's making me feel that it's not the best process at a committee level. Um, for the full city council, it's it's ten with one and a half minutes per for public comment. Mm -hmm. Ten people. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could do for every committee meeting five uh, with one and a half minutes in the beginning. Now, the chair can always open up for public comment or as a public hearing. They're going to do it anyways um, on an issue after. So, no one comes in for public comment. They can always open it up on an issue. So. I, I wouldn't have a problem, you know, you know, for a committee meeting, it's five people with a minute and a half. We can always adjust it if people want more. Uh, full city council is 10 because you're expecting more people to come to a full city council. Uh, and if people come in later and the, the chair wants to open up on that certain issue, they can always suspend a rule. So I, I think that's a pretty good idea because there, there are times people just want to come down and say something might be a community, so I wouldn't mind it. Cool. Thank you. Councilman McGivern? I am siding a little bit more with what Linda said, but in saying it maybe a little different. But, you know, the committees have always, you know, with exceptions, but have always let people from the public speak on a matter as we're, as we're debating it. You know, in other words, like we go through, we read the order first, and we start talking about it, listen to the person, the department head, or listen to the proposer. And then we look around, and there's people you can see are chomping, ready to say something. And, and committees have always invited those people to the, to the microphone to talk about the issue. That's different than public comment. That's, that's, that's deliberation, you know, on an issue as we're deliberating it in what I call a study committee. You know, we're not taking the final vote, but we are we're talking about what the recommendation is going to be to the full city council for the final vote. Um, I, I think it works the way it does now because we're not shutting people out. And, and, and we do, the, I believe the public comment works good with the, uh, the full city council level. But what really um, concerns me is most committees have to do statutory public hearings at one time or another. Ordinance committee all the time, you know, DGR sometimes. Occasionally, maybe charter and rules are going to be doing some public hearings. When you have a statutory required public hearing, when the public hearing is closed, the comment, the receiving to, to this body, to the full city council eventually, is shut off. So the maker of a petition who wants his own change or, you know, the, the department heads or, and not the department heads, that's a correct, correct strike that, but the you know, people that are offering us testimony can no longer give us testimony. We can no longer take that testimony. If we open up without control a public comment area, you're going to find people, lawyers, other people, trying to sneak in new stuff and talk about the item that the public hearing is already closed. So I think it's better if you do it one, one item at a time we have people in the audience, they want to talk about the item that's currently being discussed. Invite them up. 
Thank you so much, Councilman Gibbon. And I just want to ask a question. Do we have control at the regular public hearing at the city council meeting, or can an attorney still slip in? We and don't, and we've, we've had some tight situations with that. So you know, where my thing is I think we can clear that up in the rules, but I agree with Councilor yeah. McGee. Um, and also, let's talk. Sometimes, I know I've sat here, you know, I'm, I was like the adopted <laughs> ordinance committee member last term, and now I'm on it, so I feel good. But sometimes some members of the public have to sit there for an hour, two hours, if the item's at the end of the agenda, to wait to speak. And I know I've had some people here who are like, hey, if I could speak on that item, go home, we could write it. If they want to leave, they may be able to leave. And a lot of times that's why. They're chomping on the bit for an item that's later in the agenda. They can speak, get it out, get out the room. And so for me, I think, and again, it's just a fair compromise. I also heard this from the public, so this is where this stems from, is hey, on items that aren't public hearings, if they're before the committees, we want to go in and state our opinion, get off. I think we can tighten up the timeline and we do need to control on the main city council public speaking and even this one exactly that if you're gonna maybe we add a section what item number you're gonna speak on and if it's not anything to do with the committee's items even in front of it or that's on the agenda don't come speaking to us about an agenda item from last week that's not on here or we from do, last we, month yeah, we do that for the full council now you cannot come into the public comment unless it's something on the agenda yeah, yeah. And to Joe's point, I don't think I was, I was clear enough, is um, if there's something like a public hearing and the public hearing is closed, you are correct. We cannot legally take more testimony. That would have to be drafted into this. And you know, we open it up to, like, I'm making up the number five people for a minute, minute and a half. However, they cannot offer up other testimony if it's part of a public hearing or something. Is that way we're, we're closing that gap? I'm, I'm just trying to, because there are people it's, that do come in and they're not going to wait two, three hours it's, for it's, an issue. It's not that we can't get more testimony and, and still make a in you know a, a good vote. The problem is is if if you let people offer testimony after the public hearing is closed, other people yeah. say, hey, there's no public hearing, so I don't have to go listen to what people are saying. So you've got you've got to have that tight frame of it shut off. And, and, and I think we're violating that with some public comment at the full city council meeting. I think it's happened more than once. Councilor yeah. yeah. I guess with ordinance, we have certain things that are defined as public hearing. We do have people that come down on certain matters. And in that case, the body votes to suspend the rules for the people to speak on the matter. When people come down and they're down here at 6.30 and they're down here on a particular matter, we become aware that they're here for that. And I believe you've often seen us go out of order on the agenda in order to be <coughs> responsive to people from the public that come down. I really feel, and, it, and you know, we've changed rules for different committees. I really feel for ordinance committee, it's seriously muddying the waters. What is a public hearing? What is public comment? You know where are we at with what's on the agenda and what isn't on the agenda I just I think it's a slippery slope but that's my opinion on it Coach and McGee what if there was and Joe and Linda are making right. really good yeah. points what if what if the, instead of listing a number of people for a certain period of time because then like you know tonight no one must be awesome no one shows up <laughs> And we have people there, and okay, you just move forward. And what my if comments are say, not directed at the public on, in the <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. What if, <laughs> what if we said, um, not so much a rule, but that uh, chairs in the beginning of a meeting, especially a long agenda item, have the preference to suspend the rules to open up the public so people can make 10 minutes of comments, then shut it down, then move on to their business. Would that kind of help or no? Um, I don't I mean, know. The, depending I, on the meeting, it allows the chair the ability to, okay, the full room, some are here for this, I'm going to open up a general, everyone mention your stuff so that way you don't have to see it. Would that help? No? I or think not? the fair compromise, and this just goes back to what my colleagues are saying, if if it's good for the, you know, if it's for the full body, and that's the full body, I think that at the committee level it should follow the same process. That's just my belief, like, you know, we're going to go with this recommendation, Either way, we could compromise it. I'm cool with, you know, even saying, hey, public comment, if it's not a, a uh, oh my God, why am I drawing a brain fart? Public, what is hearing? this? Hearing, sorry. 
well, excluding a public hearing item. So like if there's a public hearing item, you can only, you can't talk about that. You have to wait for the public hearing. You can only speak about, that's just my compromise idea. I'll get to you guys in a minute. Hold on one second. <laughs> they're chomping at the bit. Look, there you go, there's chomping. Um, I just think that again, if we're gonna make it a change, it's a change. I think it should be fair across all the committees because then you're gonna get into, you know. And again, I've, I've there, and this is with all due respect, the committee chairs are great that are here in this room. I don't know that every committee chair, if it's not a rule, necessarily has to follow, or if they're seeing people that, again, they might not agree or agree with five minutes, as long as people are respectful, we have those decorum rules in place, they don't have to take it up, you know, and we've seen those, I don't know, that, I'm just throwing out ideas and stuff like that, Councilor Bacon and then Councilor McGivern. Okay, so in committee, we are debating or discussing an item that we will then be recommending to the council. The council is the deciding body on the matter. So if a member of the, the members of the public who wish to weigh in on an agenda item properly come to the public speak out at the city council meeting, which is where the decision will be made. A committee is debating the items mm -hmm. to make a recommendation. So it seems to me the proper place for the public to weigh in is the, at the place where the decision will be made. I'll, I mean, it's like we could end up having people at the committees coming yeah. in, coming to the council. Which I is, mean, but I, and I wouldn't discourage that. I think what I'm trying to say is, I'm just use me as an example for the whole CPA fight. I propose something. You, we all propose something. By the time it hits the full body again, it's a done deal. We have a lot of items that if people maybe felt the had the opportunity at the committee level to just speak out in the public in the beginning. By the time we either first propose it, it gets sent here to committee. If they don't necessarily see an open time, or who knows, who feels comfortable saying, hey, I'm going to go down, and if they know, if the public knows, hey, at every committee level, you get five minutes at the beginning, and it's the same thing, sign up time. You only have the first five, ten minutes before the start of a committee meeting, you have to sign up, and if you didn't sign up in time, boom, you're done. And then again, if the committee chair still wants to suspend the rules, they can, but it's just offering that fairly to the public. But for the CPA thing, I know a lot of the people in the community gave me heat, and they felt like at the committee level, like, hey, by the time it got back out, you guys are already done. And again, not to say, and this isn't, uh, this isn't more of a, we're just talking about this now, how do we get the meetings out there more? People felt like, well, on tonight we have four different meetings going on, well, one got canceled, but local cultural council, you know, all these different meetings happening in one night, who could choose to come here or there? And we still accept emails as comment and public commentary. I'm not just saying that there's not other methods, but I just think that it's a fair process to allow the people in that. I want the public. I want to hear from the residents and constituents and voters while we're debating at the beginning. If you want to give your input or you have a you know draft language, email it to us beforehand and get up there and say, hey, I emailed the committee members this draft language. I hope you guys can consider it tonight. I'm just trying to make it a more open process, and that's all. I'm not trying to say that what we're doing now is wrong. Just make it and codify it more a little bit. Again, five minutes sign up. I like the five and a half rule. I think that's a good, you know, compromise. And I don't know, Con Councilor McGivern. Let me try one more time. I think your proposal is hurting public participation, and, and I'll tell you why. Okay, in in the full city council meeting, it's public comment. It's limited to an item on the agenda, and it's limited by time, and we and we listen. And, and I think we should listen. You know, as, as it happens, people come down. Hey, you're going to be talking about this. Please take this into consideration, or you know, whatever you know, wants whatever they want to say. At this level, you know, the participation, if it's you know, like I said, public hearings are public hearings. I'm concerned about that. But the participation tonight, we had we had public comment on two items, right? That was very informal. It was just spontaneous. That was a public hearing for both items. For both of them. Yep. Public hearing. We open the public hearing. We you want to talk on this one? We, we continue the public hearing until mm -hmm. dates are in their public hearing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but if you do it at the beginning of the meeting, okay, now we're seven items into the meeting, and the people that came in later or come in now want to sit down and say, hey, I, I have a, a thought about that. Public comment's done. Sorry, we can't accommodate you. And with all due respect to my colleague, I disagree, and you just proved my point on the reciprocal. Mr. Joseph's been sitting here. He could only speak on those two items in the public hearing. He can't weigh in unless we suspend the rules. And all I'm trying to say is we are a political body. What if, if on this three-member committee, two of the people on the committee say, well, those people are just going to be the same people who are going to complain the whole time. I don't want to hear them. Two out of the three committee members don't suspend the rules. 
one of the members wants to suspend the rules. Mr. Jost goes home. He hasn't got a chance to speak at all tonight on the other items. It's You just proved the point that if at the beginning <coughs> Mr. Jost was able to comment on all the rest of these items, still be a part of the public hearing for the public hearing, and now he could have gone home by now at 8.30. He's been here the whole meeting. Bless his soul. Thank you. And we're using it as the example. You just proved the reciprocal. He then had the opportunity to comment on everything else. He got the chance to go away after the two public hearing times. But now, unless we suspend the rules to allow him to speak right now, he can't. And the same thing's true. Like you said, someone could come and sit right now, come and miss, come home late, watch us online. They could still email us. But at least at the beginning, we've given them a fair chance to comment on everything that they want to comment on for the rest of the agenda. So just, I disagree. If you, if you have a public hearing scheduled on the agenda, three items down, public comment is first. And there's 70 people here who want to talk at the public hearing. Are you going to let people talk at the public comment about the public hearing item? I think that's where you have to make that distinction. That, and that's what I'm saying. That's where I'm willing to amend it. But, to say but everything you, you said public. someone has to you know, get in and get out. They're going to want to do it. Right. And yet you haven't opened the public hearing yet. Yep, Councilor Bacon. So what is being said doesn't go on record. Correct. This but, is. Oh, sorry, hold on. But to just make clarification, even for our regular council meeting, what's being said by the public isn't going on record. I have not seen anything typed up from any public comment since I've been here the last two years that has made it to our minutes, that has made it into public record. So what I'm trying to say is we got to clean that up too in our rules. We have to make sure that if anyone's getting on that mic, it's being typed up and it's being included. So it could make it there. And I think that that's, that's a whole other issue. And again, we could well, clean it up. And what I was trying to say is exactly that. If, and that's what Todd is saying, we can clean it up to say excluding a public hearing item. So if you're here to speak on the public hearing item, you're 70 people here for the public hearing, and we have to take it up at a specific, specific time because that's what we said we're going to do, then you could put public hearing one this time, public hearing two that time, and then public comment goes right after that. And so then you know you have to wait till after those two public hearings, you can comment on every other agenda item, and then you can get into it. Council Bacon, sorry. Thank you. That could be as onerous as waiting for 10 agenda items if there's two public hearings that have a lot of hot um, emotions behind them. Um, I would, we are a representative government. I'm elected by thousands of people. Most of them can't come to the meetings. And my concern is that if we start creating a public comment stream for the few people that can come down, we're like creating an unelected city councilor that's coming down and debating at committee. We're elected by the public to represent them at the committee. We put ourselves forth, we say what we believe in, we say what we don't. And I really think we're giving undue influence to people who might come down here on a regular basis and really have a potential bully pulpit that the other public cannot avail themselves of. So I mean, if you know what I mean, and I'm, I'm kind of saying that to make an argument, because I'm not against it. And I think for David, as an example, comes down and makes great points. So I don't want him to feel like well, I'm like uh, picking on him. But I'm just saying that as a process, mm -hmm. what we see in city council is basically the same seven people coming to the mic every time. Yeah. If the goal is to hear from the public, we're failing. Yeah. Because you know we're hearing from uh, yeah. my a very small number of people. So I do object to this. I think it muddies the waters of the committee process. And I think the discretion of the chairs has been well uh, serving the public from my experience on the council so far. And I would urge you to leave it to the discretion of the chairs. Thank you. And again, just uh, my final thought, my final thought of the evening, we still suspend the rules for those same seven people. So that argument would be great. And with all due respect to my colleague, we still allow those same seven or five people, no matter what, to speak. So why not just let them speak at the beginning, get it out the way, and move on? So again, I'm willing to compromise. And my thing, as we've said with everything else in this body, if it doesn't work, we change it or we get rid of it. I think that we should, you know, again, me, and this is for me hearing from the public representative of the people, I, this is what the community that I've heard has said they want, they want to see. And again, I, I you know, like I said, I'll, I'll stop there. We'll entertain motions, either approve or deny, or no, no, no. I don't want to I just, approve or deny. I'll, I'll just make a point. Table is, or well, we brought up concerns that it has to be tweaked in some way to kind of address some of the points. 
the, the issue would be for me is, and I'm not making the motion yet, is to table it. We come back with yeah. a final. Right now, it, it's only in debate form. We, we got to fine tune it to then say this is what's going to be voted mm -hmm. on to then be as a rule. Yeah. So I know Joe's got a question, but I, I'm just saying that's yeah. where I would like I to agree. go. Just, I agree. just, just a, a final thought. Because everybody thinks this that there are rules to suspend for committee meetings. There are no rules for committee meetings. The chair rules. Robert's rules. Yes, Robert's rules. Robert's rules. And it gives a very detailed explanation. I own the book. Several, actually. <laughs> Go ahead. Our 27th rule is when all city council rules fail, refer to Robert's rules. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right, so then uh, the will of the bodies to table? Well, I, that's what I'm just saying. That's yeah, why I'm I'll looking to do it. Whatever. So yeah. then that's... that we can tweak this yeah, to come done. back as a ultimate proposal. Sounds good. Or, uh, <laughs> Second. Second all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? All righty. And our final fun one for this night. <laughs> no, wait. I don't understand. Item that seven. Was... We're in uh, motion take up item seven. We got two more. Not the fun final one. Oh. Trying so, to get rid of us? Yes. I, sorry. <laughs> item number seven. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Um, this is followed by me. Ordered that the city council review in collaboration with the city clerk the process for a citizen's petition that appear in the city charter, making the process more streamlined and standard. I'm actually just going to ask the committee that we table this because I need more time to work with the clerk on this. You know, I emailed her just literally the other day, but I need more time to work Motion on Motion is to table. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Now the final fun one. Motion to take up item eight. <laughs> Second. So all in favor? Aye. All right. Ordered by myself that the official... We do an official charter change through ballot question and that it be placed on the next municipal election calling for a recall provision. I know this was an ordinance already got brought up. Um, I was able to pull up the final legal language that I believe Crystal gave you all an ordinance. Um, and I just, you know, I would like to see this through. I think in light of recent events, um, I would actually like to see this on this election ballot. So I asked Councilor Vega's uh, office and team how would that be or how would that work? And again, I have to reach out to the city clerk, so in no way do I think we're gonna take this up today, but um, the process would be from Councilor, uh, Councilor uh, State Rep Vega. They would home rule petition it. We would have to get it out by next month, the latest. It would be a special election that the city clerk could call the same day as the state election. There'd be a separate paper ballot that people would put in for that ballot question, and they would count it after the state results are certified. So all of our seven precincts would have to certify their state ballot questions first and state ballot elections first and then they would certify this or I just want to see it on the next municipal I'm just concerned that certain parties who don't have to run next time will campaign or compete against this I think with a lot more voters paying attention to this issue now we need this recall provision for the exact same reasons that we're seeing now not to say that there is any malfeasance I'm not pointing the finger or accusing anyone but what if something was to rise to that occasion in the future we have no mechanism right now in the city of Holyoke for any four-year elected official to recall, to take them out of office if they have done anything inappropriate, they could just stay there. So that's just my thoughts, and I'll leave it there. Councilor Beacon? Could you just remind me what that timeline was to file for the home rule petition? So we have to get it by March because then everything needs to be approved by July, and they're not sure that if we do April or May, they'll have the timing before July to get it in. Does the mayor have to sign off on that? Mayor does have to sign off on this, and I've spoken to the mayor about it. He says that he's willing to sign off on this together. Isn't that where it got stopped before? He That's did not right. sign off on it last time. We spoke with about that. The mayor felt that it was, you know, again, targeted just towards his office or him last election cycle. I had said that's not the case. I wanted this to be fair across the board. There's more than one four-year elected officer in this role. And so um, he did, did not want that to be a referendum on that. And so this time I have, you know, verbal confirmation that the mayor is willing to sign it. We'll see if we pass it, but Councilor McGee. That's what I was going to get at is we took it up as a body already. We approved, approved it. Approved it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's... it's a, it's already been done. So right, and I'm, I'm willing to do I'm it again. I'm not going <laughs> to vote to delay or say, we've done this. Right. So my motion is to 
Okay. Right, that was what I was going to say. Yeah, I don't know. Into the, uh, it, this is yeah. not like it's new. It's the same one we it's took exactly months. Yeah, it's exactly right? months. Yeah, the exact same one that you... I think we were unanimous on yeah, ordinance. the exact same language you guys submitted is what I have so, from legal. Unless you're saying you want to change nope, something. Nope, it's alignment. the exact same language. That I was going to make a motion to adopt. Oh, okay. And a motion is to adopt. Second. Yeah. Do you have any discussion? I'll try to make it. No. All right. Motion to adopt. So uh, I'll be the motion or the second, whichever. <laughs> there was all the language. Crystal gave it to me. I can forward it out. Yep, yeah, we still have it. Yeah, she, it's the exact same one we already did. Yeah. That's the weird part. But the mayor yeah. stopped it last time. Oh, it I was remember, very well. He, he came in with the proposal first, the and numbers. you guys went through a lot of detail. Mm -hmm. He did. Sure everything was absolutely. Yeah. So no, I, this is. It's good government. No, this has already been addressed once. It's just fixing the. I'll call it the glitch. Sorry, just documenting. And I will get the law department to give us a copy of the approved legal language. Because they should have it right in yep, their they should have. file. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, that's all of our agenda items. Motion to adjourn. Next, most is to, but the next meeting is March 19th. March 19th. We'll have more fun that day. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's about the first turn of rules. Barely. <laughs> <laughs>